Hi, this is Randy. Welcome to Straight Talk. I want to speak to you today about the importance of a new believer or a Christian learning how to give. You know, the Old Testament law demanded that the, the Jews love God and one another. And we know this because that is what Jesus explained when asked about the law. And God's law also required the people to give a minimum of 10% of their income for tithes and then some additional offerings to be brought to the temple. Now, today Christians don't always want to do what the scripture says, but it, I know it's different for the church today because God demands the Christian to love more than the law required back in the Old Testament. And they're actually to give sacrificially until it hurts. In fact, Jesus said to give up everything and give them a hundred percent. This is exactly what stewardship means, becoming the business manager or the property manager of God's things. See, your stuff is not yours to squander and then just flip God a dime whenever you feel like it. God's got a standard of scripture through Jesus that tells us a whole different story. I know the majority of Christians in America use grace as an excuse to not even give 10%, let alone more than 10% of their income to the church. But here's what's important, and you must understand, grace is not a license to be greedy, irresponsible, or selfish. Grace means to give more. How do we know that? Well, the way Jesus taught his followers. Uh, here's some of the words he used. You have heard, speaking the Old Testament, but I say. See, Christ taught his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount that what the law required was not enough. And repeated these words many times through the Sermon on the Mount. He, he asked them, what do you do more than others then? Do not even the publicans do such and such? See, this teaching of more is essential to understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Even C.S. Lewis gets the, to the heart of the matter when he says, I do not believe one can settle how much we ought to give. I, I'm afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. In other words, if our expenditure on comforts, luxuries, amusements, etc. is up to the standard common among those with the same income as our own, we're probably giving away too little. Now, if our charities do not at all pinch or hamper us, I should say they are way too small. These ought to be things we should like to do and cannot because our charitable expenditures exceed or exclude them, is how he worded it. In other words, we should be giving a lot more way than we choose to in our selfishness. But here's the point. At least... The law of God forced people in the Old Testament to give a minimum of 10%, which is far less than love would ever do. The basics and minimums of, of the law are fundamental standards of education for the new and immature Christian. Here's what Paul says to make sense of this. Until the time when we were mature enough to respond freely in faith to the living God, we were carefully surrounded and protected by the Mosaic Law. The law was like those Greek tutors, with which you're familiar, who would escort children to school and protect them from danger or distraction, making sure the children will really get to the place they set out for. This is out of the book of Galatians. Now, I hope you'll start to think this through with me. So, let's, let's be clear. It's anti-Christian to use the Bible to disobey the law of God. If you do not tithe, you break the law. Grace fulfills the law plus more. It does not give you a license to break God's law. If you give more than 10%, you have fulfilled the law through love. I repeat, you are not allowed to break the law, but fulfill it. This is what scripture says, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, is what Paul explains. Yes, Christian, you must fulfill, not break the law. 
do this really? And, and there is no need for this discussion we're having today. Now, you must understand God commands us to bring our love gifts to the local church. I know the rugged individualism of Americans drives Christians to blindly disobey the Bible here and do things in their own personal way and see no need to do what I'm going to explain. But the Bible teaches us that the local church, that's the called out followers of Jesus in a local city or town, they're not individual, they're a team. It's, it's a responsibility for that team to care for orphans and widows, needy Christians, the pastor's wages, outreach, training, for, training up disciples, buildings and facilities and etc. and whatever God gives. But he gives the loving Christians greater demands than the Jews ever were required by the law. Because God wants you to practice his passionate love. So number one, let me say this. The minimum weekly responsibility of each Christian is to bring their gifts to the local church on Sunday for the needy brothers of the faith. We are told to so love fellow Christians that we need to give as generously as we can and bring it to the pastors and allow them to spend it as they are led by God. Now, where do we get this idea from? Is it just some of my opinions? No, it's not. Here's what the Bible says. This is from Acts. And it so turned out that not a person among them was needy. Those who owned fields or houses sold them and brought the price of the sale to the apostles and made an offering of it. The apostles then distributed it according to each person's need. Notice the central location of how they worked together as a team was bringing to the pastors, the leaders of the church of Jerusalem, is what they say. Paul goes on and explains on the first day of each week, let each one of you personally put aside something and save it up as he has prospered in, a por in proportion to what he's given or gained in work so that no collections will need to be taken after I come. In other words, on Sundays, he wanted the church to gather offerings to care for the needy in Jerusalem is what he's talking about, an offering. In fact, it, it says it again in the message this way. Every Sunday, each of you make an offering and be as generous as you can. 1 Corinthians 16, 2. So what we're saying here, what we have to understand is simple. God see, expects you to give. So can I ask you a question? Can you say your love for God and your fellow Christian is so real that you sacrifice this much as they did back then when you give your offering on Sunday? It's a big question. Can you answer it that way? Well, here's the second thing I want to challenge you with. The minimum weekly responsibility of each Christian is to bring their money to the local church to give on Sunday so that the local church can take care of widows and orphans. Here's what the Bible says in Timothy. Take care of widows who are destitute. That's 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 3. Now, here we go back to Acts to give an example of this whole issue. Something happened then. It says, during this time, as the disciples were increasing in numbers by leaps and bounds, hard feelings developed among the Greek-speaking believers, the Hellenists, toward the Hebrew-speaking believers because their widows were being discriminated against in the daily food lines. Notice what it said. They daily fed and cared for the widows who needed help. It was a responsibility they took on because God called them to that and calls us to that today. He also, the word says, external religious worship, which is religion as it expressed in outward acts, that is pure and unblemished in the sight of God the Father is this, to visit and help and care for the orphans and widows in their affliction and need, and to keep oneself unspotted and uncontaminated from the world. We have a number of scriptures that tell us clearly what we are to do to help widows and orphans. So I have to ask you again, can you say that your love for widows and orphans is so real that you sacrifice this much when you give your offering on Sunday? In other words, as much as they did in the very first century as described in scripture. Number three, this is our next one. This is just the weekly requirement to support the pastors financially. Did you know the wages for the pastor 
are to be double what the average wage is in the local church of people. This means the pastor is to be paid double what you think you deserve or need for your family, and God clearly says he does deserve it. Most pastors will not demand this nor even ask for it. Do not listen to their protest. Just pay them what God's word has set for their salaries. Where do I get this from? Again, from the word of God. Here's what it says from uh, Paul and Timothy. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. In other words, the people do not, these pastors don't have to volunteer. They should be paid double, in fact. In fact, another way it's worded in the, in the message is give a bonus to leaders who do not do a good job, especially the ones who work hard at preaching and teaching. And then it reminds again from Scripture, don't muzzle a working ox, and a worker deserves his pay. Friends, a pastor needs to be paid more than you're used to getting paid. So can I ask you, do you love your God and his leaders, his pastors, to be so real that you would sacrifice this much when you give your offering on Sunday? Let's go to number four. The fourth thing I want to challenge you with is this is the weekly requirement to reach the thousands of lost people in your community around you that are going straight to hell. Do you realize that there is a great cost for the church buildings, electric bill, heating, repairs, etc., etc., and etc., so that a powerful presence of a worship and work center is kept up to gather, train, and reach out to the lost around you? And its cost is as much and usually more money than your homes and your personal castles cost. Who will pay the bills if you refuse and let others do it? Let me ask you, how nice is the church property? Who will repair and maintain the needed cost if you don't do it? Is your castle nice but God's facilities shabby? Do you love your stuff more than God's reputation? Why would we need to do this? What's the big challenge? It goes back to our Great Commission. Remember Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And yes, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Christ's love for your community is massive. You have to have a working headquarters to gather together and do that which you're called to do. So I ask you again, can you say you love your neighbors and it's so real that you would sacrifice this much when you give your offering on Sunday, like they did back in the first century, who gave so much of their lives and didn't count anything their own. Okay, um, now, what, though, if you do not have a weekly income, so you don't have to, quote, give weekly, you think? And if you don't have a weekly income because, you know, maybe you're rich or retired or, or whatever, Remember, we're not talking about tithing for Christians, but we're talking about the stewardship of God's property that you've already been given and you're in charge of. You know, God calls you to be His property manager and to use His stuff as He directs to love others. The, the Apostle Paul charges us in this way. He says, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to first use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous in those, to those in need, always being ready to share with others. That's in 1 Timothy again. Now, I want you to understand then, that the Bible gives a lot of information about this. Listen to what else it says. You already have what you want, is what Paul's talking to the Corinthians in this portion. You've already become rich. You've become kings without us. I, I wish you would could be uh, kings so that we could be kings with you. As I see it, God has placed us apostles last in line, 
like people that are condemned to die. We, we, ha we become a spectacle for people and angels to look at. We have given up our wisdom for Christ, but you have insight because of Christ. And, and not only that, he goes on and says, we're weak, but you're strong. You're honored, but we're dishonored. To this moment, we're hungry, thirsty, poorly dressed, roughly treated, and homeless. We, we wear ourselves out doing physical labor. When, when people verbally abuse us, we bless them. When, when people persecute us, we endure it. When our reputations are attacked, we remain courteous. Right now, we have become garbage in the eyes of the world and trash in the sight of all people. And Paul, he's explaining as a church planner, he, he had it rougher than these people. He goes on and says, I'm not writing this to make you feel ashamed, but to instruct you as my dear children. You, you may have countless Christian guardians, but you don't have many spiritual fathers. I became your father in the Christian life by telling you the good news about Christ Jesus. So I encourage you to imitate me. See, Paul's saying, even if you, you think you're rich or whatever, learn to surrender those things and sacrificially serve God like he did. Imitate him. I, I know the world has taught you to, to save up thousands of dollars and, and you know, and retire and uh, waste your money on pleasure because you deserve it and selfish enjoyment. But here's where God's word gets in your way and my way. Paul explains that this concept is wrong and it doesn't come from following Jesus. He said, now a true widow, a woman who is truly alone in this world, has placed her hope in God. She prays night and day asking God for his help. But the widow who lives only for pleasure is spiritually dead even while she lives. And that would be for you too. If you live for selfish pleasure, you're spiritually de dead according to this. Yes, you can slow down as you get older, but do not abandon your responsibilities as a follower of Jesus. You must do good all the way to the end. So again, I ask you, can you say your love for God is so real that you sacrifice for His kingdom daily as you live your life saying that you're a Christian. Consider these words. Relook at the scriptures I've given you. I challenge you today to serve God and learn what it means to be obedient to Him by giving. Thank you for watching Straight Talk. Until next time, God bless.